welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we'll explore the many ways we make meaning together and why we do what we do, our motivations. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with us today is the Russell B. Roth Professor of Bioethics at Edinburgh University, Dr. James Drain, who's actually Professor Emeritus. Yes, I've been retired a few years, Tim. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Glad to be here. Before we get too far, what is bioethics? Bioethics quickly is the modern version of medical ethics. There has always been a medical ethics going with professional medicine. Mm -hmm. But bioethics came into being after the Second World War when the United States government invested enormous amounts of money in medicine, mm -hmm. in medical research and generated as a result of that in, uh, investment tremendous proliferations of new procedures and new technologies and most of them raised ethical questions mm -hmm. about their use, about, about how, who can decide about them and things of that sort. And a lot of the doctors started asking uh, professors of ethics or people in, in uh, in seminaries uh, uh, for help about the thing. So that's the way uh, a person named Dan Callahan, who was an editor of Common Wheel Magazine, and I, I was, I was uh, at Yale at the time, uh, and uh, we got together and we traveled around the world looking at ways in which ethics was handled in different cultures, and then he established the Hastings Institute. That was the first established ethical institute after the war and it addressed all of the issues that were generated as I mentioned by that investment and uh, and then one year after his uh, establishment of the Hastings Center the uh, a, a person named Dr. Elligers, Dr. Helligers established the Kennedy Institute at Georgetown University so those were the first two academic uh, institutes for the academic study of the problems, ethical problems associated with contemporary medicine. That's bioethics. That's mm -hmm. the beginning of bioethics. Right. And actually, but the field, medical ethics, goes back Medical far. ethics goes back to the Hippocratic, the Hippocratic phase of medicine. Now, outside of the Hippocratic medicine, there were many forms of folk medicine. But Hippocratic medicine was based on a theory of illness, theory of therapy, and there were ways of diagnosing. And so with that structured academic pattern, you had the beginning of, 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 a, of what we would call scientific medicine, and associated with that were certain standards of ethics. Mm -hmm. And they were all accumulated into a code called the Hippocratic Code which still is used today at graduation ceremonies in medical schools as a statement of the, f the young physician's commitment to do what is in the best interest of the patient rather than his or her personal interest and to, and to guard and to respect confidentiality and not to do anything to harm the patient. All of those were classical ethical standards. Mm -hmm. Now after the war and after the, in, the investment of so much money in, in, into medicine and the proliferation of new technologies and medications, there were all kinds of new problems that required more ethical responses. And that's what the institutes at the Hastings mm -hmm. and at the Kennedy tried to do. And those of us that were part of the original group, we were the ones who did the research and Right. Did, the, did the writing and... And what were some of those issues that you're dealing with? What? Well, actually, the issues that we were dealing with then were, as I mentioned, mainly issues that had been generated by new technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, the new technologies were everywhere after, after the, the uh, government investment. New technologies, for example, that would provide you with nutrition and hydration even though you were unconscious and couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 technologies like respirators, mm 
So all kinds of technologies that would preserve a life, mm -hmm. even though the patient was unable, for example, to recover. Right. That raised the problem, do we unhook those technologies? Do we let the person die under what conditions? Who makes the decision? That's an example of the kind of ethical questions that, was gen that were generated by the new technologies, but th there were proliferations of technologies, all kinds of technologies. Right. And, and they all had associated, uh, uh, associated uh, uh, ethical problems. Now, what Dan Callahan did was establish the Institute, bring in academic scholars to study the issues and then he communicated the results of the research to the politicians in Washington mm -hmm. so that they would have some basis for legislation because they were all called upon to make some laws covering these new issues. Now do you find because of all the research that has gone on and the conferences and the presentations that we're any smarter than we used to be about some of these choices we have to make? Well I think so Tim. Uh, the, the, the material that has been generated not only has been communicated all over the world because contemporary scientific matters has been, dis has been expanded all over the world. There are American like hospitals practicing contemporary American scientific medicine everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So those problems associated with all of that you find everywhere and therefore there are bioethicists in all those places. Mm -hmm. So bioethics is spread all over the world and the, the, you would have a library of materials now mm -hmm. on bioethics. Now for instance some things like like the proper way to die or about dying and yes. death and dying and, uh, and yes. you write in one of your articles or many of them about hospice and yes. how that has yes. improved. Well, well th that's a good example of, of how, for example, the technologies applied with, without ethical parameters or without ethical modifications resulted in many patients being assaulted with technologies until the very moment of the death. Mm -hmm. So the deaths in many instances were, were, were converted into horrible experiences because of all of the new technologies. That is what generated not only questions about use and, and misuse and, and how properly to use and under what conditions to withdraw. All of those problems were generated but also it, it, al <clears throat> it also generated uh, the need for a different approach. Right. And that was hospice. Hospice uh, actually began in England and then it came of all places to northwestern Pennsylvania. It was the first place where the ideas of hospice were, were established in Warren, Pennsylvania. And, um, and what, what, what hospice did was humanize the mm -hmm. dying process. At some point, first of all, to have the physician identify when the dying process had begun, when the person was dying, and when continuing interventions is futile. Mm -hmm. Once that diagnosis is made, then the technologies are withdrawn, and the emphasis is on palliation, mm -hmm. pain relief, quality of life, providing spiritual support for the patient, mm -hmm. providing a family interaction with the patient. All of that was provided by hospice right. and a theories to justify all that. Right. So just because we have the technologies didn't necessarily make it right to try and keep someone alive forever and ever. It not only us. didn't make it right, but it made it even worse to yeah. use the technologies under certain conditions. And that's the reason why you had to have not only ethical decisions and, and, and limits established, but then they had to be transferred into legal limits. Mm -hmm. And th there's where the interaction between the academic bioethicist and the legislators came into being. Dan mm -hmm. Callahan's institute provided information, academic information, ethical information to the legislators so that they might be able to actually establish 
reasonable laws and effective laws covering issues like that. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, earliest issues had to do with the technologies, with the beginning of life, with, with the end of life, death, abortion, birth control. You know. That are still with us today, right? Still I mean, with that's us. That's a hot that's the topic in the news right the now. Interesting, that's the interesting thing. I mean, uh, my involvement with, uh, with uh, Dan Callahan was that he, uh, he was writing a book on abortion back in the 60s, and I had written uh, a lot on the issue of birth control, and uh, th that, th those two issues, uh, instead of disappearing, are still with they us. They have now just grown into it's massive grown, armies. It's you know, grown, it's like it's grown. Yeah. Yes. Well, what about that issue with with birth control that's come up in the news right now? Yeah. Uh, what are the parameters, and oh. how do we go about taking it apart to think about what is right and what's wrong? You know, for instance, the. Uh, issue right now is, I think, is that the Catholic Church is against being forced to offer yeah. birth control in their affiliated yeah. institutions yes. and such. Well, I guess uh, we, we ought to start this part of the conversation with a, uh, a statement of truth about oneself because I, my involvement with that issue came about because I'm a priest and I was a professor in a seminary, and I had had some experiences as a priest with Catholic couples who were trying to manage the issue of, pop, of, of their family limits and those kind of things that came to me for help. And I was the one who started to think about it and start to think, rethink the, the church's position. Mm -hmm. The church's position which said no to any kind of contraception and any kind of birth control. And once I published that, that was back in the 60s, uh, I, I was expelled for that. Mm -hmm. But the issue uh, didn't go away and it's still with us and it's a sad thing if you're a Catholic. I'm a Catholic, I, I'm still a practicing Catholic, but to see the hierarchy again coming out and objecting to the public policies that provided birth control, making the church's stand as a church identified with denying birth control, it alienates an awful lot of people. And it's unnecessary in my opinion, because it isn't part of scripture, it isn't part of dogma, it isn't part of the basic doctrines of the church. It's a result of, I mean, there's a long history. We'd be spending the whole half hour here doing the history. But actually, the history goes back to St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine, uh, the bishop uh, uh, in, in Northern Africa. And he, and he, was, uh, he was struggling with a group of, of radical believers who thought that everything material, everything physical was evil. And he opposed them, the Manichaeans. Uh -huh. He opposed them by insisting that, that sexuality isn't evil it, it, just because it's physical. It, it, it can be accepted. But then he, then he put, a, then he put a, a condition. If it is done with the intention of bringing about the creation of new life. That was Augustine's idea. It was Augustine's way of, of modifying his response to these Manichaean uh, radicals. And yet, because of his powerful influence on Christianity, that became part of the moral stands of the Christian wow. church. Not just the Catholic church. Right. It was the Protestant church as well. Listen, it would be a shock to many of the people to listen to this, but, but it was... Prote there were Protestant politicians who made any kind of distribution of, of contraceptives illegal in the United States in many states uh -huh. in the 1800s. Well, they've just had, many have had a thing against sexuality in general over the centuries, right? I mean, Well, there has been, that. there has been, but, but I mean, most theologies recognize the place of sexuality, at least as Augustine did, mm -hmm. in creating other human beings. I mean, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Wait for genetics to develop to the point where we're going to do it just technically? Mm -hmm. No. 
there's a recognition of, of, of the relationship between sexuality and procreation. But to say that sexuality is just procreation mm -hmm. is to ignore many, many aspects of sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated, important, critical area of human life, and it has to be looked at with all of its complexity. Right. And to ignore all of the other aspects of the sexuality and to insist that it has to be always for procreation is to really oversimplify and distort the reality. And, mm -hmm. uh, and look, you'd say, well, the Protestants were the ones who established all the laws, uh, you know, making it illegal to uh, sell any kind of uh, contraceptives and all those kind of things. But gradually, in the 1900s, in the, in the early 1900s, New York made a law ma making it uh, legal to, ex to do uh, contraceptives. And then, <coughs> and then later... That must have been bold for them at that time, right? It was bold at the to... time. It was bold at the time. But then after New York, that was about in 1918, that New York made the law. But then all of the other laws that were still in place, and they were, they, they, they were, they were contested mainly by women, women's rights and those kind of things. And then the, 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 the cases ultimately went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that they had to be legalized and they had to be made accessible. They were part of the rights of women to control their mm. own procreation and, and to control disease and that sort of thing. So that was the thing that, that, that was in, that was in 19, in the 1930s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But the Griswold versus the state of Connecticut was the case. And uh, uh, so in the United States, you know, the issue of birth control isn't all that old. And there, it, it has is associated with all kinds of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And now here we are. After that, those changes, one of the popes, in Rome in the 1960s, recognized that there were all kind of changes going on, that there was a population problem. We had too many people. We didn't have enough uh, food to cover them. He recognized that the, because there were a lot of bishops claiming that in their diocese, the women needed birth control, so that he pushed to change the church's position. This is in the 1960s. Pope John XXIII, he established a congregation, I mean, a commission for the study of this problem. Uh -huh. And the commission, which met for four or five years, started out saying, no, we have to hold to the church's traditional opinion of St. Augustine. Gradually, they changed because of evidence from Catholic couples. One of the persons in the commission brought evidence from Catholic couples, what their experience, and it gradually changed the commission. Mm -hmm. Despite the change of the commission, despite the change of all these theologians who had met together for five years or so, and despite their recommendation that the church changes, a couple of orthodox right-wing members of the hierarchy in the Vatican <laughs> repressed that movement and <laughs> repeated the necessity of keeping to the tradition. That's where we are today. Wow. And that's where the bishops today are continuing that mm -hmm. by insisting that the president's program to provide contraceptives for people has to be rejected because of... Wow. So, and, and still today, I mean, it, it's kind of a historic momentum that gets carried over for the Pope and for others who are trying to maintain the way it is. So still today, it, you create kind of a dilemma for people because you have the leadership saying, sorry, this is the way it is, you shouldn't use contraceptives and so forth, but you have people wanting to use them or seeing a necessity, so is that, are those the horns not of just, a dilemma? Not, or? not, not just that, that uh, conflict or that tension, not just between the hierarchy and, 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 and the people, but you also have an intermediary resource of moral direction, which is the theologian, the academic theologians, mm -hmm. the persons who pra who, who, whose specialty it is to do moral theology. Mm -hmm. They too, in great numbers, favor a change in 
the moral evaluation of birth control. So there's not much debate so about it? I mean, not among much, the academic there's, theologians? There's not much debate about it. I mean, that article of mine in the 60s was the first, but, but that article was distributed all over in academic places and seminaries. And, and then they did some surveys after that, and some 90% per, 90 of, of the Catholic, both academics, clerics, and, and, and lay people favored the idea of people being able to practice uh, contraception in marital situations. Right. So, so uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 you do have hierarchs, and this is, the, this is the, the, the concern. You do have members of the hierarchy who are trying to maintain the continuity of church teaching, not change. Mm -hmm. Change in the Catholic Church doesn't come easily. Mm -hmm. And this is a good example of it. Even the Pope who wanted to have it changed, John the Twenty-Third, didn't wind up getting it because he died and the next Pope said, no, we're not changing. Mm -hmm. That's where we are today. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the hierarchy that came out against the, the President's program stand in, uh, on that. But then you have other, two other sources. That's one source of moral direction in, in the Church. Another source is the, the, the theologians, the, you know, the, 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 the academic theologians, and another source is the laity with all the experience. How can a cleric who is celibate, who has no experience, be the moral director, the, the, moral, uh, uh, the moral specialist in an area where all these other good people have all the experience. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is going to be a change. So that creates conflicts at many but, different but levels. Yeah. But, don't, but don't wait for it <laughs> no, tomorrow. No, it's not going to happen <laughs> quickly, huh? Yeah. Well, that's really, but and, and those are parts of the questions that we face in many different issues, not just you know, contraception and sexuality, but all kinds of issues. We yes. have these moral and ethical yes. dilemmas. Yes, we do. And is there any way to, is there any kind of formula that exists for, or, or you know, three easy steps, here's, yes, yes. here's how to deal with your yes. moral dilemma? Well, look, look, Tim, there are, there are ways of proceeding. There are different, different uh, ways of for, forming ethical opinions. There are different strategies to follow. There are different ways of organizing the multiple, complex components of a question mm -hmm. to organize them in such a way as to make your decision about the issue reasonable and defensible. But uh, those, those uh, procedures, there are, there are some that go back as far as Cicero, for example. Cicero uh, handled the, the problem of coming to a defensible decision about ethical issues by using what he talked about as case studies. So he would, if the, case, if the issue had to do with, with some type of thing, there would be a particular case that would organize or, or, or include all of the different components of the problem. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a decision about that, and then that case would stand as a model. You, if, you have a, if you have a problem, and it's this kind of a problem, here's the case that shows you how to solve it. Okay. That's called casuistry. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways in which you make moral decisions. That goes back to Cicero. It goes back to the Stoics. Mm -hmm. okay. but, but then you have all kinds of new ones. I brought with me a... A, 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 a recent uh, a book of uh, some friends of mine uh, uh, who came to the uh, who came to our conference, by the mm -hmm. way, and they also have a model, a way of proceeding, a structure for handling those uh, kind of complex issues, and and the way the way they do it is by by first of all looking at the medical aspects of the thing, mm -hmm. try getting together all of the medical components of the problem. Mm -hmm. You're trying to, you have a problem about what the right thing to do. First of all, get all of the medical a uh, aspects, the medical components clear and, and agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Then get, for example, 
the preferences of the patient because you not only have the medical scientific aspects, you have the preference of the patient, the autonomy of the patient. That's also a, a component. Get that straight. If the patient is not competent, who's making the decision for the patient? Mm -hmm. So if, is the family involved? Under what conditions are the family involved? All of those would be covered under the second category. Mm -hmm. Then you have the quality of life of the patient. Mm -hmm. Do you have to do everything possible for every illness? Mm -hmm. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. You have to have some basis on, you have to have some input from the quality of the person's life. Suppose, mm -hmm. for example, somebody said to you, you have a certain illness and there is a treatment for it, mm -hmm. but it's in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And you have to leave your family, leave your job, and go to Kazakhstan in order to get this handled. Okay. Now, do you think you have so to go? So there's the medical aspect, but to, the family aspect is kind of in conflict with a, that. Yeah, and, and there's, there, there's the idea also of the complexity of the issue and the difficulty and the, and the ruining of your quality of your life if you're going to be out there all by yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's another aspect of the thing. And then you, you have a lot of external factors. You have issues like confidentiality. You have issues like research needs and the role of subjects of research, all kind of complexities. Mm -hmm. But that's an example of how you try to pull all of those things together to make moral decisions. Mm -hmm. In this book, I have a, a, a whole series of different models mm -hmm. that are... So on that issue of contraception and the government requiring it now and mm -hmm. the church saying, no, you can't require it, yeah. how can we apply a moral or ethical decision-making framework to that? Well, In 30 in, seconds. <coughs> in 30 seconds. <laughs> you, you first of all have to see that there is a legal dimension to this, namely there's an interest on the part of the, of the government in providing this kind of help for people. That's, a, that's the legal aspects. How do you proceed legally to get that established? Right. Then you have the moral aspects, and we talked about how you organize the data in order to come to a moral decision. Mm -hmm. And then you have the issue of, for example, the freedom of the church. Mm -hmm. And the freedom of the church is identified, in this case, with the freedom of the bishops but the church is broader than the bishops. But that's the issue that they're focusing on, that namely their freedom to stand in a certain, on a certain position regarding this and not to, not to be forced by the government to violate that. Right. There's where you have the conflict. Right, and then uh, you, of course you have the conflict at all kinds of different levels with people within the church who are disagreed on that. And then certainly, as you said, the certainly, but you have to have within the church as well as within the political community, you have to have ways of mediating and reconciling different perspectives. Now, are the bishops, they're certainly standing for what they believe. That's respectful. Is it the best way to do it to say we're not moving and that's it? Or would there be ways in which they could provide some basis of compromise? Well, I'll tell you what. We're coming to the end of this segment, but this is just so fascinating. So I'm hoping that you're going to stick around oh. and explain to us how this unfolds with a few examples. Uh, maybe we'll do a second segment and All right. do it yeah. that way. Okay. So, Dr. Well, Jim Drain. With the big money that I'm making. Here, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for being you're with welcome. us for our first episode of Meaning and Motivation. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for being with us, too.